What are the elements of a cause of action? Jurisprudence provides that a cause of action requires the following elements. First, a legal right of the plaintiff. Second, an obligation on the part of the defendant to respect or not to violate such right. And third, an act on the part of the defendant violating the right of the plaintiff. Distinguish failure to state a cause of action from lack of cause of action. Failure to state a cause of action and lack of cause of action are distinct grounds to dismiss a particular action. Failure to state a cause of action refers to the insufficiency of the allegations in the pleading, while lack of cause of action refers to the insufficiency of the factual basis for the action. Dismissal for failure to state a cause of action may be raised at the earliest stages of the proceedings through an answer by raising it as an affirmative defense, while dismissal for lack of cause of action may be raised any time after the questions of fact have been resolved on the basis of stipulations, admissions, or evidence presented by the plaintiff such as in a demurrer to evidence. In failure to state a cause of action, the veracity of the allegations is immaterial. In lack of cause of action, this is invoked after the plaintiff has rested its case and the judge must determine the veracity of the allegations based on the evidence presented. What is the test for failure to state a cause of action? The elementary test for failure to state a cause of action is whether the complaint alleges facts which, if true, would justify the relief demanded. Here is a case question. Spouses S. Indian Nationals purchase a land in Bel Air and a condominium unit and place the title thereto in the name of one of their sons, G, in trust for said spouses and his siblings. Years later, the other children filed a complaint for reconveyance, partition, accounting, and declaration of nullity of documents against G, several banks, and the Register of Deeds of Makati, praying that they be declared lawful owners of the properties in accordance with the express trust agreement and the provisions of the civil code. Defendant G sought the dismissal on the grounds of prescription, lack of capacity to sue, and that the complaint fails to state a cause of action. The regional trial court dismissed it based on lack of cause of action. First question, is the RTC correct for dismissing it on the ground of lack of cause of action? The answer is no. The RTC is not correct for dismissing the case on the ground of lack of cause of action. Failure to state a cause of action and lack of cause of action are distinct grounds to dismiss a particular action. The former refers to the insufficiency of the allegations in the pleading, while the latter to the insufficiency of the factual basis for the action. Dismissal for failure to state a cause of action may be raised at the earliest stages of the proceedings, while dismissal for lack of cause of action may be raised any time after the questions of fact have been resolved on the basis of stipulations, admissions, or evidence presented by the plaintiff. Considering that in this case, no stipulations, admissions, or evidence have yet been presented, it is perceptibly impossible to assess the insufficiency of the factual basis on which plaintiffs assert their cause of action. Hence, the ground of lack of cause of action could not have been the basis for the dismissal of this action. Second question, did the complaint sufficiently state a cause of action? The answer is no. The complaint did not sufficiently state a cause of action. Plaintiffs failed to sufficiently allege the basis for their purported right over the subject properties. Since the spouses, being Indian nationals, were prohibited from owning land in the instant case, they were likewise prohibited from transmitting any right over the same 
through succession. Even assuming that the facts alleged in the complaint were true, plaintiffs would not be entitled to the reliefs demanded because, first, plaintiffs premise their right over the subject properties as heirs of aliens who may not own land or transmit rights over the same by succession. And second, plaintiffs failed to allege that they were in fact heirs of the spouses under the laws of the Republic of India. The allegations of the complaint failed to sufficiently state the concurrence of the three elements for a cause of action, particularly the legal right to the relief demanded. In view of the foregoing, the complaint must be dismissed for failure to state a cause of action. Another case question. X filed a complaint for sum of money against Y. X filed a motion for leave to file amended complaint to implead the estate of the late Z, Y's deceased husband, as additional defendant represented by Y, the wife. Y sought the dismissal of the complaint as representative of Z for failing to state a cause of action raising this ground as an affirmative defense. The trial court did not dismiss the claim as against the estate of Z, ruling that the inclusion of Z's estate was necessary for a complete relief on the determination or settlement of the controversy raised in the case. Question. Should the case against the estate of Z be dismissed? The answer is yes. The case against the estate of Z should be dismissed. Neither a deceased person nor his estate has capacity to be sued. A deceased person does not have the capacity to be sued and may not be made a defendant in a case. A deceased person or his estate may not be implicated as defendant in a civil action as they lack legal personality. When Z died, his legal personality ceased and he could no longer be implicated as defendant in the present ordinary civil suit for collection. The complaint against him should be dismissed on the ground that the pleading asserting the claim states no cause of action or for failure to state a cause of action. A complaint cannot possibly state a cause of action against one who cannot be a party to a civil action. What is meant by splitting of cause of action? Splitting a cause of action is the act of dividing a single or indivisible cause of action, claim or demand, into two or more parts and bringing suit for one of such parts only, intending to reserve the rest for another separate action. It is a mode of forum shopping by filing multiple cases based on the same cause of action but with different prayers, where the ground of dismissal is litis pendentia or res judicata as the case may be. When is a joinder of causes of action valid? Under the rules of court, a party may in one pleading assert in the alternative or otherwise as many causes of action as he may have against an opposing party, subject to the following conditions. The party joining the causes of action shall comply with the rules on joinder of parties. The joinder shall not include special civil actions or actions governed by special rules. Where the causes of action are between the same parties but pertain to different venues or jurisdictions, the joinder may be allowed in the regional trial court provided one of the causes of action falls within the jurisdiction of said court and the venue lies therein. And where the claims in all the causes of action are principally for recovery of money, the aggregate amount claimed shall be the test of jurisdiction. Here is a case question. X filed a single complaint in the regional trial court against Y for first quieting of title involving a land with an assessed value of 1 million pesos, and second, sum of money based on a contract of loan between them for 5 million pesos. In Y's answer, it was alleged that the complaint should be dismissed as the causes of action are misjoined. Is Y correct? The answer is no. Y is not correct in arguing that the causes of action are misjoined and should be dismissed. According to the Supreme Court, 
misjoinder of causes of action is not a ground for a dismissal of an action. The causes of action in this case are misjoined since quieting of title is a special civil action that should not be joined with some of money case governed by ordinary rules. A misjoined cause of action may, on motion of a party or on the initiative of the court, be severed and proceeded with separately as provided by the rules of court. By exception, if X refuses to accept the severance, it may lead to the dismissal due to the fault of the plaintiff pursuant to the rules of court.